Hello, this is Michael, and thank you for tuning in. In this video, I'd like to present the main ideas in my book, highlighting the importance of global cooperation and the difficulties in getting there. Now, in order to understand society and the major societal challenges of our time, we have to start with understanding the ingredients of that society. We have, to under, we have to start with understanding the humans that populate it. The social architect that doesn't have any knowledge of the ingredients with which he or she is working, is like a cook who doesn't have any knowledge of his or her ingredients. Well, the result is quite often disastrous. So we have to understand ourselves. And that brings me to the question, what makes Homo sapiens special? Now, if you ask that question to people, quite predictably, you'll get the answer that what makes us special is our intelligence. We call ourselves Homo sapiens, the wise hominid. And indeed, in our recent evolutionary history, our brains have doubled size and we've acquired all sorts of specific, distinguishing, and very sophisticated intellectual abilities. We must, however, still ask, why did these big brains evolve and these new cognitive skills? And there are a number of important factors that enter into account. First of all, our recent evolutionary history well, took place in times of great climatic instability. Those were the ice ages and the interglacial periods. And so our ancestors needed enough flexibility in their behavior, in their strategies to survive in order to thrive in such an environment. And this requires quite a bit of brain power. We're also a migrating species. Well, we've migrated not only as Homo sapiens all over the world from Africa, but we've done it earlier in our evolutionary history as Homo uh, erectus. And so again, we needed to thrive in very different kinds of environments, which requires flexibility. And then finally, also an important factor is that we're not the fastest of the bunch. So in order to hunt success successfully, we needed complex tracking skills and all sorts of strategies. But the most, most important reason why we've evolved these oversized brains, this cauliflower head, if you will, well, is because of cooperation. Now, cooperation, as we'll see, human cooperation, is quite exceptional in a number of different respects. And for cooperation, well, we've evolved a set of very specific skills. Skills or intellectual abilities that distinguish us from our closest evolutionary cousins, the chimpanzees. Now, first of all, humans possess a sophisticated theory of minds. That means that we're wonderfully able to read other people's minds, to know what goes on, what people think, and uh, what uh, they feel, what their intentions are. And this is incredibly important for cooperation. Because if I'm going to cooperate with others, well, I need to be reassured that these others know what they need to do in this cooperative activity, I also need to be reassured that these others are motivated to fulfill the task, to do their part in that cooperative action. So I need an ability to read other people's minds in order for me to make it uh, interesting to invest time and energy in any kind of cooperative activity. A second important Distinguishing point between humans and chimps and other animal species is, of course, language. Other species communicate as well, but that communication is much more limited. We possess an open-ended linguistic system of communication, and that enables us to cooperate in an incredibly flexible way, because we can very precisely communicate what we expect of others. And then finally, what also distinguishes us is the fact that we're wonderfully able to copy the behavior of others. We often say monkey sees, monkey does, but actually we should say human sees, human does, because it is precisely there or in that uh, kind of context that we're much more able than our primate cousins. 
Humans possess a large number of so-called mirror neurons in the motor centers of our brains. And this enables us to take over and learn very complex technical skills from one another. Because these mirror neurons, they will light up when we see somebody exhibiting some kind of physical activity or technical skill as if we were doing the activity ourselves. And this underlies the ease of cultural learning of taking over complex skills. And because of these specific and very sophisticated cognitive adaptations, well, human cooperation, as I said, is quite exceptional. It is incredibly large scale. It is also very flexible, remember, or linguistic abilities. And it is what they call diachronic, meaning that we cooperate over time from generation to generation. And this is precisely because of these mirror neurons and this ability for cultural learning. We take over the skills of previous generations, and often we're not going to copy it in a very faithful way, but we're even going to improve it and um, pass it down to future generations in an improved version. You see that other intelligent animal species, and for instance, the chimpanzees also have forms of cultural learning. They have kind of cultural innovations. They exhibit certain kinds of behavior which are useful for them. Uh, in terms of survival, uh, but uh, and, and that kind of behavior is not hardwired in their genes because we see that certain groups do it and other groups do not do it, like chimpanzees in the wild being able to crack nuts with rocks or fish for termites, you know, with twigs. Um, we see that that behavior is culturally learned, but very often over time they lose these kind of skills, and in no uh, instance have we observed that they built on these previously acquired. Uh, cultural skills. Humans are able to do that, and this, for a very important part, underlies the dominance of our species. But we must still ask, why did we evolve all of these cooperative tendencies and skills? Just saying that the species as a whole profited from it is no evolutionary explanation. Evolution will only select traits that benefit certain individuals within the population that possess these traits over other individuals within that population that do not possess these traits or not to the same extent. And so the reason we are so cooperative and we're so able to cooperate, well, is, and this may sound paradoxical, because of competition. More precisely, because of group competition. Now, groups that were wonderfully able to cooperate with one another inside of that group, while well, they had an advantage over groups that weren't able to keep all of that cooperation or to, to have that you know, very strong, very creative, very flexible cooperation. So these groups well, were the groups that thrived, the groups that became larger, the group that influenced and conquered other groups, and so therefore, or cooperative tendencies are very much the result of a context of very strong group competition between groups of humans throughout our evolutionary history. And since competition, group competition, is the architect of within group cooperation, well, there's a dark side to our tendency and our ability to cooperate, and that is the fact that humans are also hardwired to be suspicious and even hostile towards members of other groups. They call it the in-group, out-group bias, and it's a human universal trait. We see it in very young children. We also see it in all cultural groups throughout history. And one could not have evolved without the other. And so from the lens of our evolved social psychology, we can analyze all of human history, all of our great achievements. And I've put the first man on the moon here, but of course I could have put any number of different uh, uh, kind of achievements, uh, technological achievements. Well, they came about through cooperation, through our ability to cooperate over time, as I've said, which is the distinguishing feature 
of human cooperation. But our history is equally exceptional because of the constant stream of very destructive, violent conflicts between groups. But there's more to our story. Some 12,000 years ago, for the first time, we would introduce a new kind of technology that would radically alter the fabric of our society. And that technology, or those technologies, are agricultural technologies. And because of agriculture, as I said, our societies would go undergo profound changes. Because once you start cultivating the land and having herds of animals, well, uh, you get much more calories for a certain plot of lands than you would as a hunter-gatherer if you have to hunt and you have to gather wild edible plants. And so what we see happening in those first agricultural settlements is that the population size exploded. Now, hunter-gatherers typically live together in bands of about 150 individuals. Now, in those first agricultural settlements, quickly that number reached a thousand, a few thousand, and so forth. And so that presented those groups with a very important challenge. And that challenge is, how can we maintain social cohesion and the cooperation within these groups? Because humans are wired to live together in these small, close-knit, homogenous groups where they would only interact and cooperate with people that they knew very well from birth in this small kind of hunter-gatherer tribes. And now we live in a social context or our ancestors started living in a social context. And obviously we still live in such a social context in which many of our interactions would take place between total strangers that do not have any basis for trust. And so we can assume that for the first time, there was a higher degree of conflict within the group. And in order to maintain the social cohesion and the cooperation within that group, well, social institutions emerged. Sets of rules that would orchestrate the cooperation and the interaction of the individuals within the group and punish strategies that would um, be problematic for the group. So we see, and we see this in very different contexts because the agricultural revolution first took place in uh, the Middle East and then uh, independently, probably a few uh, millennia later in Asia and in uh, South America and so forth. But interestingly, completely independent from each other, we see the same kind of dynamics and we see the same kind of rules. So we see the groups expanding and we see these social institutions orchestrating and organizing society. So we have property and criminal law in order to curb um, strategies, uh, violent strategies to acquire goods uh, and, and any kind of antisocial behavior that could result uh, from competition between individuals that do not have this shared basis of trust. We also see a set of rules um, in order to preserve common, common goods, public goods, uh, such as drinking water in arid regions or green pastures for herding uh, societies. And so in order to preserve these common goods uh, and protect them against exploitation by individuals who would take more than their fair share, well, uh, this needs to be organized, orchestrated and regulated. And this is what we see happening in all of these agricultural societies, these larger sedentary groups. Uh, we get a number of rules that organize and orchestrate uh, uh, that society. But these rules, these social institutions, well, they also emerged because of an evolutionary process. This time, not a biological evolutionary process, but a cultural evolutionary process. But that process is driven by the same kind of architect, the same kind of driver, and that is group competition. Because societies, agricultural societies, agricultural groups that possessed these social institutions or some versions of these social institutions, well, they had an advantage over groups that did not possess these rules, these uh, political structures, if you will. And so they outcompeted these other groups 
they conquered these other groups or they just outcompete them in the struggle for uh, lands and so forth, uh, and, uh, or they were imitated by these uh, other groups. And so we see that is why these uh, social institutions, these set of rules became uh, almost universal social institutions. But because competition is the architect of cooperation in this cultural evolutionary process, just like it was for social psychology in a biological evolutionary process, well, not only cooperation is going to be scaled, but also conflict. So we also see other things emerging in those agricultural societies. First of all, we see borders emerge. This is a fantastically efficient way of keeping cooperation within the group and also protecting against the hostility of other groups. We also see something very interesting happening with religions. Now, as far as we know, biologically modern human beings have always had some kind of supernatural beliefs and rituals to interact with uh, supernatural entities. So religion is by no means a recent phenomenon, but religions will undergo a profound change in those last 10,000 years um, that we've become agricultural uh, people living in larger groups. And the profound change they underwent is that religions became more and more moralistic religions. The typical hunter-gatherer religions are animistic religions. Now, they infuse their natural world with spiritual essences, and they have all sorts of rituals to interact with these supernatural essences. But crucially, those animistic religions don't have any rules about how humans should behave uh, towards one another, how society should be organized. Uh, they don't have any kind of moral rules. Morality entered religion rather late, and now it's a key feature of most world religions. Think about uh, uh, Judaism, Christianity with the Ten Commandments. Islam is also a highly moralistic uh, religion. And so the reason, according to scholars of religion, that morality entered into religion is because it enabled to Cope, uh, to keep the cohesion within groups that became ever larger. Now you have a big punishing God saying how you should behave, and you've got an eternal uh, uh, punishment in hell if you do not uh, abide by these rules, a very strong incentive to keep people in line. But as you all know, religion did not only promote in-group cohesion, in-group harmony, in-group cooperation, but also quite often, at least originally, promote, promoted outgroup hostility. And as a result, uh, we've had uh, many religiously inspired conflicts since then. So not only cooperation was scaled, but also conflict. And with this new kind of political infrastructure, we get uh, an evolution towards ever larger groups or alliances of groups, blocks. And this would kind of culminate in the 20th century, where you see the entire world population or almost the entire world population belonging to one or uh, to two camps that are opposed to each other, that are at the uh, foot of war with each other. We've seen it in the two world wars, of course. We've seen it in the Cold War. And according to some, we see a new kind of polarization uh, happening or emerging now, uh, that of uh, the Muslim world against the Western world, or jihad versus Mac world, as Barber puts it. But again, there is more to our story. Some 150 years uh, ago, two new types of technology would start emerging that would radically again alter the fabric of our societies. And these technologies are communication and transport technologies. And because of these technologies, well, goods, people, ideas, information are no longer contained in the groups in which they first emerged. We've entered the era of globalization and with it come fantastic opportunities and possibilities. Never has cooperation 
been scaled in this way. And the result is that innovations or the rate of innovations, well, uh, goes into overdrive. We've got more progress, more wealth and so forth. But globalization also comes with a very important challenge. And that is the challenge to cooperate on a global scale. All of our major societal problems today are thoroughly global problems. They affect people globally. And in order to tackle these problems, we must cooperate on a global scale. Think about climate change. Well, we're only going to control climate change if and prevent its disastrous effects if we cooperate globally in order to curb the emission of greenhouse gases. But also think about the vicious circle of climate change together with poverty and overpopulation that would lead to massive migration streams, which would be very destabilizing for societies. And I believe we've only seen the beginning of this uh, and overpopulation, which would feed back into climate change and so forth. In order to get out of these, uh, this vicious circle, we must cooperate globally. And the same goes, of course, for preventing a nuclear Armageddon, given uh, or uh, the development and weapon technology, while well, we cannot afford uh, a global war, of course. And um, well, to link with our current predicament, well, the COVID-19 pandemic is also a thoroughly global problem. Uh, we, it kind of shows how globalized the world has become. Uh, a Chinese virus becoming a global virus in a matter of months. Well, uh, but it also shows how important, and this is kind of what is happening right now, how important it is to cooperate globally in order to overcome that problem, uh, to uh, prevent you know, the pandemic to spin out of control, uh, to uh, develop vaccines and provide the whole world population with access to these vaccines. These are all global challenges uh, that um, can only be um, that can only be met successfully when we cooperate globally. So our world has become thoroughly global, but the problem is that our psychology or innate tribalism and or institutions or political structures lag behind. And in the book, I describe a number of different important factors that could contribute to getting us to global cooperation and global harmony. And the first uh, factors, well, they pertain to overcoming or tribalism. And there's a number of important elements that could contribute to that. Firstly, education. History shows time and again that when reason and reflection is held in high esteem and people are given the tools to reason and reflect, that not only society becomes more wealthy, that there's more wealth in society, this is kind of predictable because if you give people the tools to reason and reflect and the freedom to reason and reflect, well, you'll get more innovations and this will tra translate into more wealth for the group as a whole, but also that these societies typically tend to become more tolerant. Now, this is interesting. And the reason behind that is because when you start reflecting about society, about moral norms in general, well, you quickly come to the conclusion, and this conclusion has been reached in very different historical periods by different societies, that there's no principal difference between a member of the own group and a member of the out group, and that therefore those two shouldn't be treated differently. A second important factor is facilitating positive contacts. Now, obviously, when people from different groups enter into a positive contact with each other, well, they kind of lose their tribalistic tendencies and they're open. Uh, their moral circles, if you will, to members of other groups. Now, in a globalized world, we enter into contact with people from very different cultural origins, uh, whereas this wouldn't have happened, uh, let's say, 200, 300 years before, at least not for the great majority of uh, the people living back then. Uh, but this is a double-edged sword. 
when these contacts are positive, well, this does indeed you know, open moral circles, bring down walls. But when these contacts are forced in a, a kind of atmosphere of suspicion, lingering hostility, we see exactly the opposite happening. It actually kicks our tribalism in overdrive and people become more suspicious, more hostile towards other groups. And I think the media have an incredibly important responsibility here. All too often, we only hear about tensions and conflicts between groups, and we do not hear enough of the fact that there's more and more cooperative interactions between different groups, and there's less and less conflict between those groups. And it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're going to show people all of the conflicts between different groups, well, you make people more suspicious and more hostile, perhaps, if you're going to show them that, well, actually, there's less and less conflict, there's more and more cooperation, and there's really positive contacts between different groups, well, it also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People lose uh, their tribalistic uh, views, and uh, they open their moral circles, and therefore you kind of feed back into that positive process. And then the final important element is feminization. Now, violent conflict between different groups throughout human history has been almost exclusively a male affair. Wars have been started by men, have been fought by men. And there's good evolutionary reasons why men tend to be you know, born warriors in a certain sense, because, uh, and this is uh, kind of um, male warrior hypothesis, uh, well, the reason is that, um, well, these male warriors, well, they, they acquired quite a bit of status and therefore saw their reproductive opportunities uh, skyrocket throughout human history. And we see that in all cultures, well, uh, men are more likely to engage in violent conflicts than women. We also see that in societies where women are given prominent places and there's equality between the two sexes, well, that uh, those societies often, uh, quite often, typically become less uh, likely to engage in any kind of conflict with other groups. As the feminist writer Virginia Woolf stated it, war will not end as long as women are kept out of power. And she does have a point, or at least that's what the data show. And so these three factors, well, they've already proven their enormous worth. According to Steven Pinker, who's written an important book about the decrease of violence throughout uh, uh, the last uh, centuries and millennia, uh, well, he argues that these three elements are key features in what he calls an ongoing civilizing process from the late Middle Ages, where group conflict was a, an incredibly common occurrence and violent occurrence, to, our, to our, our time today, the most peaceful of all times in human history. And what led to this ongoing civilizing process, according to Pinker, is first of all that after the dogmatic Middle Ages, well, we've got uh, the, the emphasis was put on independent, autonomous, critical reasoning and reflection in the Age of Enlightenment uh, that would reach, you know, its. Uh, 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 it, it would really become very prominent, but it started in, in the Renaissance. Uh, we also see that um, because of the rise of international commerce, there were many more positive contacts, and this also led to pacifying these relations between different groups. And then finally, more recently, throughout the 20th century, we've seen a wave of feminization sweep across uh, many countries in the world. And all of this has um, led to a trend towards more harmonious international relations, less conflict, more cooperation. And it is very much on this trend that we have to continue today. We have to provide quality education on a worldwide scale, not only to solve or to deal, eradicate poverty, because that will obviously be the best strategy to, uh, to combat poverty is to educate uh, the people living in poor countries, but also equally importantly, to protect future generations against otherwise very attractive tribalistic ideologies. 
We also, as I said, have to bring to light all of these positive contexts, the responsibility of the media, because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we have to facilitate the, those contexts as much as possible. And then finally, we have to insist on female right, women rights, on equal gender rights, uh, because that will that is a moral imperative in itself, of course, but uh, it will have a very positive effect on human society. But in order to get to efficient global cooperation in the face of these global challenges like climate change, poverty, migration, and so forth, well, we also need a strong global institution that orchestrates that cooperation. Now, luckily, we have such a global institution, United Nations, and that is undeniably an incredibly important step in the right direction. But all too often, we see that the UN proves kind of powerless to deal with these global uh, challenges efficiently. Think about the climate problem. And the reason for that, the main reason for that, I believe, is that the way the United Nations are structured now, and this also goes for other supranational institutions like the EU, for instance, uh, well, it gives rise to international negotiation. It brings together representatives of different nations who come together and negotiate on the global policy. Now, all too often, that doesn't lead to global policy that is in the long-term interests of all of the stakeholders. So we must move from international negotiation to global cooperation. In the book, I develop a proposal uh, to strengthen the United Nations and yeah, other super, supranational institutions with, citizen, with a citizen assembly, so a global citizen assembly. Now, this would consist of a randomly selected representative lot of the world population which would be informed by experts on the global problems they are tackling, and which would then deliberate with one another in order to come to a high degree of consensus around certain policy proposals. Now, social experiments, which are very much in vogue today with uh, such forms of participative, participative sorry, uh, citizen uh, um, democracy, citizen assemblies, well, show that these very these assemblies very often lead to well thought out uh, proposals. So very interesting, uh, sometimes even creative proposals. Uh, but more importantly, that uh, almost without fail, it leads to proposals that are in the long term interests of the group that is represented. Now, this is very hopeful, and this makes it a very promising tool to strengthen or democracies in general, and especially to uh, strengthen and improve our global governance. Because one thing is certain, we've entered a new era, the era of globalization. And as I said, that era comes with enormous possibilities, great promises, but also with a major challenge, the challenge to cooperate on a global scale a challenge for which humans are not well equipped, given our innate tribalism. If we're going to succeed in doing so, well, is of course an open question. Nobody can look in the future, but I am cautiously optimistic. The historical trends, as I've pointed out, are undeniably towards less conflict between groups and more cooperation between these groups. And so, despite the Trumps and the Brexits of this world, well, I don't see any principal reason why this trend would now be reversed and we'd start moving back towards more conflict and less cooperation. But of course, we shouldn't just lay back and wait for this global utopia to emerge. The global problems we are faced with are urgent problems and they require action now. And this brings me to a last idea I'd like to um, 
present to you kind of philosophical reflection. And that is that for the first time in human history, we have matters or our fate in our own hands. Remember the first alienation, the agricultural revolution and the problems that followed in the, in the wake of that first you know, revolution of our societal structure. Now, as I've said, the solutions that came about, they came about through a process of trial and error, and they were culturally selected. Solutions that did not only scale cooperation, but also scaled conflict. Today, for the first time, we are in the unique position of actually consciously, with foresight, implementing the necessary solutions to our problems. We're very well aware of the important problems that are facing us. We're also very well aware of the solutions to these problems, what we need to do to overcome these problems. And we're aware of all of the obstacles or innate tribalism or political structures that um, could prevent such an efficient solution. So we're in the unique position to take matters in our own hands. We no longer have to be the tragic toy of blind evolutionary processes, processes that predictably, as I've put, pointed out, also scale conflict. Society, we must realize, is not given. It is made. And it is our historical responsibility, I believe, to make the best of it. Thank you so much for your attention. More information about my research in general, my book you'll find on my website.